first time I ever went to Fry's, tragically, I missed out on the, uh, the first phase. I was a bit too young, and, uh, and, and so the very first gig I ever went to was the very first one at the borough, which, if I remember rightly, was the Groundhogs with Otway and Chris Needs pounding the bongo. It moved in phase two from the, the out-and-out out, out out hippie to a more um, exciting, getting back a little bit to the 60s, I felt, really, in a way. Um, Dr. Feelgood, for example, a very exciting rock and roll band, you know, that you, know, you went and you thought, wow, that was amazing. Whereas before you were saying, wow, that was cool. <laughs> that was the difference. I first got involved with Friars in around about 1971, when it, um, phase two, which was uh, in the local authority hall then. And I worked, um, for the council in what they used to call their entertainments department. So anything that was going on in the old market theatre borough assembly hall, I was usually there as duty manager. So when Friars came along, that was a bit of a bonus for me. Uh, instead of dealing with um, the normal sort of dinner dances and wrestling and the sort of acts we used to get there, I was suddenly dealing with uh, the rock fraternity was shooting me down to the ground. It wasn't every Monday night. That, that bit was yeah. over. And it was a, that bit bigger. Mm. You know, from the groundhogs where there were loads of people the first and then when Fleetwood Mac and hardly anybody turned up. Yeah. Which is a very odd mm. thing, but of course they weren't very famous. And they, they'd had their bit as a blues band and hadn't reinvented themselves. Whereas someone like the groundhogs, the place was packed. <laughs> yeah. It was quite every, funny, ev that whole, everybody whole, knew, yeah. you knew what you were going to get. For a yeah. night at the ground hall. Oh, I mean, we carried on doing the doing the door at the Borough Assembly Hall throughout phase two, right? <laughs> I mean, David Bowie, the the yeah. first time he played there, and and, mm -hmm. and when Freddie Mercury came, he now Freddie Mercury must have become a Friars member to come in to watch David Bowie. I was on the door. I could have said no. So that, you know, without me, there might not have been a Queen. Definitely, from uh, I'd say phase two, the the three Bowie gigs, I mean the first one, the fact, um, turned up with some friends and I think I was the only one who actually knew who he was and the other sort of, it suddenly clicked when he, when he played Space Oddity because they just, imagined, just remembered this bloke on top of the pops with uh, curly hair and 12 string whereas here's this man rather extravagantly dressed <laughs> with a lot of makeup on. Well, I, remember, I remember the Dunstable, the Friars Dunstable venue because actually it was, that, it was a big oval shaped place and I actually saw Bowie there, which must have been a Friars gig. Uh, the only time I really saw him, apart from that roundhouse thing years later, um, but it was uh, it was a good time, musically for a good time for us. You know, Foxtrot was going well, Summers really was working on stage, so we were starting to sort of motor a bit. During the David Bowie concert, when he took his jacket off and threw it out into the audience, and I managed to hold on to a corner of it, and the, the jacket was ripped. So but I managed to have quite a substantial corner of it, which I took home and put away in a little pot. I mean, apart from it being a fantastic gig, it was a great 24 hours because Robin had this idea that he wanted to make it really special. So he suggested that we go and buy flowers uh, and the best place to buy flowers in bulk was going to be Covent Garden. And I don't know how we managed this but it, we must have known somebody. Um, my friend and I managed to get backstage and so I stood next to him. Then my memories. And Robert had arranged to borrow some forms from the grammar school. Forms of the, the benches that fold up and so his idea was, and it worked, was to turn these upside down, open them up fill it with earth or something and then just slot the flowers into the, 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 the earth and then hoist them up with rope. And there they hung over the stage while Bowie and the band were playing. We would never be allowed to do it now with health and safety. But, and of course it was, it was one of the most fantastic gigs ever. I never thought I'd be sitting in a dressing room with Bowie when he's sitting there telling us that he's going to come back as Ziggy Stardust. You know, because he'd gone down you know, so well. I mean, that's a bit weird, you know, because he, he was sitting there with hair like this and he came back and he had the Ziggy cut. 
if I remember rightly, he's wearing these sort of enormous blue Oxford bags that look like a skirt. They were so big and uh, I think sort of white satin jacket with uh, sort of costume jewellery on it or something. But it was just the most amazing thing I had ever seen. And even to this day, it's still... You don't forget David Barry. I remember the first show where he did the Ziggy Stardust album. Um, it was a just a knockout. Couldn't believe it. Pure theatre, excellent music. What a band. Everything about it really was top notch. Going to see Bowie twice. First time when he still had long hair. Just he must have been just after Hunky Dory came out and he still had the long hair, and, and the hall was only half full. Um, and I remember him sitting on the edge of the stage playing his 12 string. I think he was probably doing Changes or one of those songs off Hunky Dory. Um, and then like six months later, he came back as Ziggy and you, the place was absolutely heaving. People were hanging from the rafters. It was complete madness. So they were two, two fantastic gigs, but in, a very, in, in, in very different ways. Um, I also particularly remember coming back from college to see, specifically to see the MC5, who were uh, you know, one of... The, the, the legendary bands of, of, of their era, and I think, you know, very influential, as, as we realise now, although it probably wasn't appreciated so much at the time. And I particularly remember that one, because I think it must have been in the middle of the miners' strike, or one of those sort of three-day week things where there were power cuts going on, and the gig had to be run off generators, um, so the, the hall and the town around it was in, almost in darkness. You know, it was the only light in the centre of town was on the stage and the MC5, so that, that gave the whole, that whole gig a very sort of unique atmosphere. Genesis, yeah. I gigged with them a couple of times when Keith and I were DJing and we had a superior PA to them. So they always played through our PA and we've never been paid for the higher rates yet. They, maybe it'll come. The gigs I remember um, certainly one that stands out is Genesis uh, when Pete Gabriel um, cajoled the audience and we as part of security, I was at the front of the stage, um, organised, I could see him all, uh, trying to organise people to get the cradle arms out so he could come off at the, um, towards the end of the knife. Well, the show he played next was the one where Peter broke his ankle. He jumped into the audience, pre-surfing days, and the audience parted bang on the floor. And there he went down and his leg crumpled underneath him. You heard a <coughs> and people thought, floorboards, they've gone. And we looked, floorboards haven't gone. Looked on his face, you knew exactly what had happened. He'd broken something. And after the set, before the encore, he came backstage, you know, complaining he'd, he'd hurt himself, you know, and he couldn't do it or he wasn't sure. And we were like, get on, man, be a man, get up there. You know, we pushed him out on stage and he hobbled around. And then after that, Tony took him to the hospital to find a broken leg. And I went to see Jill, his wife, to explain that he's missing an action but would be okay. I remember the ankle incident. It was um, a bit of a surprise, to say the least. But uh, forever the trooper, Mr. Gabriel, carried on for a while. I saw Stackridge there. I saw... Um... I even remember seeing David Bowie coming on to doing keyboards with another band. He was sort of guest artist for a friend there, uh, Steve Harley, Cockney Rebel. They, they, they were showmen. And, and it, that was in the days when it was more than, more than playing, it was shows. I was very lucky in the Bar Assembly Hall days to see the two shows by Cockney Rebel. Now at the time, Steve Harley was absolutely the latest sort of pop god, really. They played a fantastic sellout show at the Borough Assembly Halls on the Saturday evening, and it was absolutely baking hot. The atmosphere was tremendous. And the ticket supply was so sort of rare that Dave Stocks decided to put on a second show. And that became a sort of literally a hot ticket in town. People were queuing up to get them. And I got in the following week to see them again. And um, I remember particularly Cockney Rebel were fantastic on stage. The, the deepest memory I have is um Lou Reed playing, and uh, we'd, 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 sold rock, we'd, we'd been to Crystal Palace in the afternoon to see uh, one of the garden parties they had there, and arrived back and uh, hoping for a good night, and uh, we, we stood at the front for the majority of the show, and our friend's dog somehow gained 
entrance to the room and, and found his way onto the stage. And great fun with the road he tried to chase the dog around the stage. Running around Lou Reed's feet and just in tears then. It was just a, such a funny sight. Oh, what I remember about Lou, he looked so fabulous on stage. He had this wonderful outfit on with, with silver stars down the legs. and He looked really fabulous, like real, real transformer, you know. And that was the business for me. It, wonderful. It, Lou was brilliant. Of course, I think a week later or two, I might be wrong, Dave will correct me on this, um, Velvet Underground played, and that was just afterwards. I remember going to the Christmas party, one of the first ones, and um, I loved Alice Cooper. And so I made an Alice Cooper white top hat with all the glitters and Alice on it, and uh, God, <laughs> what an idiot I must have looked. My first prize gig was in 1972, and it was to see Focus. Walking in, and because I used to go to Hazel's Disco every Sunday night. Going to Friars was just mind-blowing because it was so different. And I walked in, it was pitch black, and I thought, what are these people doing sitting all over the floor? And it, it was just a real surreal experience. Um, but the thing about that gig was I didn't actually see focus because I had to go home. My mum came to pick me up. I'm sure it was a pretty things. We came along and the curtains were completely drawn. And suddenly this classical music came booming out. And then the curtains opened and bang into the heavy rock. And that was, that was quite spectacular. I remember the OCBC gig um, for much the same reason as many others would. Um, but maybe not for the reason that two might have done. Uh, because they just stripped off middle of the floor, didn't care, and just carried on dancing. I can remember plainly they had a bizarre one because that was planned the night before. So when I was up on top of the stage looking down on them, and Mick Mosser, Dave Shards, and Ginger, the three of them take the clothes off and start dancing. It was something else. And it didn't cause such a uproar. So I went a few years, just take the, put the clothes back on and, yeah. That was one of the few gigs where probably 80, 90% ended up watching the two guys rather than the band. But the band itself, unbelievable. And I managed to climb onto a speaker stack and stood there and Steve Harley actually sang to me, or at least I swear he did. I just can't begin to explain how brilliant that felt. Chris Needs was um, pretty good. I mean, he used to play bongos. I mean, it, it was just basically spectacle, not really music. And uh, he used to play bongos. And the great thing about him was, it, if you pumped up the excitement enough, he would literally make his hands bleed, which, <laughs> which used to go down the storm. Bebop Deluxe, another band which I loved. Bill Nelson, tremendous guitar player. And I was uh, just speaking earlier about an Italian band called Leone, progressive rock band, very influenced by bands like Genesis and Van der Graaff Generator. And I was at school with the bass player from Marillion, Pete. And uh, I remember him and I going to that gig together and we both loved them. They were a three piece, a bit Emerson, Lake and Palmerish, but tremendous. The support band I remember very well because they were called Leone from Italy and they let off a load of doves. But the, what, what's very spooky about my first show is that Ian Mosley, who now plays drums in Marillion and has done for 30 years, uh, was the drummer with Darrell Way because they were very good friends. One of the things I always loved about the Borough Assembly Hall years was that sort of sense of anticipation as you queued up in the alleyway, um, past the pub to go up the steps, actually into the hall, and then up into the hall and then down the steps again to in, get into the main uh, body of the hall. And there was, I, I remember there was always a real sort of whoever was playing, I mean, even more, more so on some nights than others, like the second time Bowie played, but it was almost it was sort of manic, but whoever was playing, there was a real sense of excitement and anticipation as you, as you waited to go in and uh, for the festivities to start. I saw a band called Griffin, who were a sort of folk rock progressive band, and I absolutely loved them. And I went out the following week to the record shop in Aylesbury and bought their album. I think it was called Midnight Mushrooms. 
all your, all your friends and buddies went there, you know, it was wonderful. All the time. You know, it was, it, you know, the bar was a bit of a handful, you know, especially in the borough. It was about 10 deep, you know. <laughs> but um, it was really nice, yeah, interesting and lovely atmosphere. I'm probably almost unique in having been to Friars as a, a member of the audience, been involved in the, in the running of it when I was working with David at Earth Records and also having trod the boards, um, both at the Borough Hall with, with Warren Harry and at the Civic with, uh, with, with Otway and Barrett. Um, and I particularly remember at the Borough doing the gig with, uh, we supported Hunter Ronson. As most people who've been in support bands know, you know, when, you, when you're supporting the main act, you normally sort of lucky to get any sort of sound check and, you know, you don't really get any room on stage because the main band want all their stuff left there. And so you normally get the sort of short end of the stick. But I vividly remember Ian Hunter really going out of his way to make sure that we were looked after, that we got a proper sound check. Genesis had just released an album called The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. And I think that the DJ played a single that they were going to have out. And I remember it getting booed because it was quite a sort of poppy single. It's been well documented over the years about this booing incident at the Friars Gig. What it was is Pete just trying to get a bit of a sort of a reaction, interaction with the people. He said, the more you like it, the boo. And so obviously it was a little game we were playing with the audience and it worked, you know. But if someone arrived mid-set, I'm sure someone did, mid-show, mid, mid -show, they must have thought, what is this, you know? They sound quite good while they were booing, but it worked. I remember the Queen gig. Um, Dave Stops asked me to go down to the hall with others. I think Steve was there, a few other people. Uh, and the, the, they arrived, started setting up. The manager was there, and he was quite a bumptious guy, um, typical for sort of managers of that period. Um, and he also had a cigar, and I think that's the bit that really stood out. Uh, suddenly, the, someone went over to him and said, we'd measured the stage, it's not big enough. It was, I think it was known as the circus tour, and they were going to put a circus tent up or something like that. Uh, and the manager came over to, to us and said, they, they weren't going to perform, they couldn't put the, the scenery up, so that was the end of the matter. Um, he was there, the band weren't there, it was just, just him and the roadies. Talked for a while and then we realised that actually the band were over at the Bell Hotel. So I went over to the uh, hotel, found the rooms and actually found Freddie Mercury's room where they were all gathered. Uh, they were really gracious. We went in and Steve and I had a discussion with them and although the manager was saying, you're not playing here, it's not right, we've got to do this right there, she said, no, we're going to play, we want to play Friars. Uh, that was a really nice thing to do. And of course they went on and it was a fantastic gig. We did go to the Queen gig. Um, in my mind, I didn't know whether I went to the Queen gig. I seem to remember it, but I kept thinking, was I old enough to go? But actually I did. And I was amazed <laughs> to discover when I went through the loft the other day, I looked at a book full of all these flyers and I've got the Queen flyer. We enjoyed ourselves getting, getting great views. We, we, certain bands, we, we were looking around at each other and saying, who wants the door? I don't want the door. It's Cockney Rebel. I don't want the door. It's Bowie. It's Jack. You have the door. Who's newest? You can, you, you're on the door. <laughs> I'm at the front of the stage. In phase two, I can remember the ground holes. We're going in the Borough Assembly Hall. I can remember standing at the back, which is, didn't go down onto the sort of stage area. Obviously. And these were so loud, I can remember. You know, that was, I think, one of the most, you know, an amazing gig to go to. I remember Capability Brown. Uh, the first time I saw them, I just thought they were a terrific band. Uh, loved the music they, they played. Uh, and of course, to meet them, that again, they were charming, really nice guys. I've got a sister who's four years older than me. And so she's been, you know, she'd been talking about Friars. And I we sort of seemed to have missed out on a lot of music like Genesis and David Bowie and people like that playing a couple of years earlier. So I was very excited when I sort of got my first uh, Friars membership card. Because he had a little membership card. You probably still do. Yeah, well, um, Warrior was, um, was the band that I was in when I was, when I was at school. And it was, um, you know, my first band and I wrote all the music for it. And obviously for us, to play Friars was just 
an un- unbelievable dream. And but we actually managed to do it. And I remember we, you know, we supported Stackbridge the first time. Yeah, I, re- I remember working at Earth Records and. Um, a lot of the albums that came out during that period, uh, Ziggy Stardust when that came out, um, sold lots of copies. And bearing in mind, it's probably the smallest record shop in the world. Uh, really, really tiny. Um, and if people thought it was tiny out front, it was even smaller behind the counter. Um, and and uh, had a great bag, um, purple bag. Uh, but yeah, lo- lots of great records. and. I seem to remember one of the biggest ones that we had was the Pink Floyd when that came out and sold loads and loads of that. So, and it was a great meeting place. I mean, there was very little room, but lots of people would come there and meet and talk, talk about music, talk about Friars. Uh, made lots of friends there. It was really good. The bands I booked into uh, Friars, um, probably you know, from what uh, David calls phase two, was uh, Genesis, Van de Graaff, Spread Eagle, uh, Trevor Bilmus, I think, came up there at one point. Um, Capability Brown, of course. Um, and then the Curzels played there at one stage when I was managing them. Um, and then David used to ring me up an awful lot and uh, see if I could either inveigle other agents to free acts or he used to use me as a sounding board for, for, for people you know, who, were, who were coming up. Um, I think maybe Atacama played there. And we certainly did, we did quite a few shows over the years that I booked into Watford and um, High Wycombe Town Hall. So, I mean, you know, I think David got his money's worth out of me for various acts. Phase two, the venue, I think, was the same because it was still, I know it was bigger, but we still knew each other because, like, when we went to Fires, of course, we also, we all went to the Derby Arms, we always went to the Dark Lantern, so everybody, it was quite a small group, even though there were a lot of people about, but, you know, so we used to know an awful lot of the same sort of people. And it was very, very similar. Again, no trouble, really. I, I, I pretty much wore the old Levi shirts and uh, denim jeans and things and, uh, you know, boots and things. I had much longer hair than I have got now. I think we're all desperate for our hair back. We used to dye it hennaed and all that sort of thing, you know, so. And lots of patchouli. I seem to remember the smell of patchouli wafting over the borough assembly halls quite a lot. but. I think as he got to the um, Civic Centre, it was more kind of beer and cigarette smoke. Um, yeah, I remember at the end of the Andy Fairweather gig, low gig, which was the last gig at Bar Assembly Hall, that David Stops played Space Oddity by David Bowie and said, this will never be played at a Friars gig ever again. And it was really, really emotional. Um, and then we moved into phase three um, at the Civic Centre, which it took a while to get the atmosphere going there because the Borough Assembly Hall was quite small and intimate and suddenly we're in this large, or what seemed to us very large, cold venue. Um, but it, it got going after a short while. 